Wamanjik Tenakoto, welcome to the first Australia and New Zealand School of Government Centre for Public Impact Reimagining Government webinar for 2022. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present. I want to extend that respect to the First Peoples of the many lands represented here today and to First Peoples in attendance. I'm on Wurundjeri land and I want to acknowledge that sovereignty of these lands and indeed the lands of the whole country were never ceded and that we must acknowledge these and other truths as a necessary step towards justice. On this front, there is some cause for optimism here in Victoria, where the Yuruk Justice Commission held its first hearings this week, a topic that I'm sure we'll touch on today. To our friends and colleagues in Aotearoa, New Zealand, I want to acknowledge Maori as Kangata Whenua and Treaty Waitangi partners. I'm Simon Kent, Deputy CEO of Thought Leadership here at ANZOG, and I'm the moderator for today. It's great to have you here for this, our third year of reimagining government. Based on your feedback, we're continuing to evolve both what we talk about and how we talk about it. For those who've been to one of the previous 11 webinars that we've now held, you'll notice some changes, including uh, the introduction of a case study, which was uh, specifically uh, sought after, and a speaker at the end whose role it is to draw together some reflections uh, on what we've been talking about. To those of you attending for the first time, welcome. We have three more events planned for the remainder of the year, so please keep coming back. Uh, in this also our third year of a pandemic, I'm sure we're all very familiar with, uh, with uh, online engagements, but just a few quick tech reminders. Um, please, can people stay on mute and keep their video off? Uh, just to let you all know too that the webinar will be recorded and available later and published with automated captions. I really want to encourage you to participate in multiple ways, including tweeting using hashtag reimaginegov, that's gov, G-O-V. Uh, and please contribute comments and questions in the chat right throughout. Don't wait until uh, the end. Get the discussion going uh, nice and early and let's, let's get into it. So today's topic, uh, what will it take to rebuild trust in government? Should be a great discussion and our aim is that you leave here today with something that you'll adopt into your practice that helps build trust. So let's have a great conversation and let's go away and do something different. So just a little bit of context. According to the Edelman Trust Barometer data that was released just, just very recently, just about six weeks ago, Australia having experienced a 2021 boost in trust uh, has had a decline in the most recent data published. So almost reverting back to 2020 levels. This trend was the case across government, media, business and NGOs. So it's, it's broader than government, even though that's the topic today. According to Australia, according to Edelman, Australia is a middle ranking uh, country. So not so low as the US or the UK, but not, so, not as high as Malaysia or Singapore. Um, unfortunately, Edelman doesn't survey in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I uh, would have been really interested to draw in that comparison. So that's a little bit of context, but the real point of today is to talk about building trust from whatever the starting point is, and that's really the focus. What do we do to um, build trust? We have a terrific panel here today to discuss the topic, uh, to discuss this topic, and I'll uh, briefly introduce you to them. I won't give you their full CVs. They're all very accomplished. Uh, and you can read them elsewhere, but uh, I will give you a little bit of context. Najay Nelson is an associate with the Centre for Public Impact in North America, supporting uh, the City Innovation Team. Najay was a co-author on the CPI paper, Finding a More Human Government, that informs the today's discussion. Najay has a background in community organising as president of the George Washington University chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People. Najay has also been an intern with both, both the Peace Corps Office of Civil Rights and Diversity and Save the Children USA. Marcus Stewart is a proud Nira Ilum Bullock man of the Tunnerong Nation. Marcus is co-chair of the First Peoples Assembly of Victoria, serving alongside Aunty Geraldine Atkinson. This is a role he's filled since the Assembly was established in December 2019, so uh, pretty coincidental with uh, lockdown. It's, a, it's been a, a lockdown job. 
uh, and uh, pandemic jobs, so an, an interesting challenge for a, a, a startup organisation. A key part of Marcus's role at the Assembly is leading a process towards treaties with the state of Victoria. Prior to this, Marcus was the CEO of the Federation of Victorian Traditional Owners Corporation. Um, Ariadne Broman is the Bunting Chair of Public Administration at the Australian National University and also Deputy Dean Research here at Anzola. Ariadne's research interests include citizen engagement, policy advocacy, digital politics, gender and the future of work, and young people in politics. Importantly, she's also currently undertaking research on storytelling and policy advocacy. You'll hear from Ariadne at the end of the webinar when she will provide some reflections and point us towards our next webinar, which will be on an issue close to her heart, storytelling. We were going to be joined by Chris Eccles, former Secretary of DPC in each of New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia, so quite a collection, and a former Chair of the Anzol Board. Chris was very keen to be here, uh, but unfortunately had an unavoidable clash and sends his best wishes. Chris was going to provide the inside government perspective, uh, a role that I will try and uh, fulfil in Chris's absence, given, given my background in government. So let's get into it, and I want to start by hearing from you. We've got a poll question that Shannon is going to share, which uh, is how, how much you trust government to do what is right? Uh, and we've modelled this actually on the Edelman uh, questions. Uh, so that's how they, uh, they've structured it. So enter your answers, and once you've entered your answer, uh, feel free to just write a few words in the chat about why you've answered that way. Uh, so, uh, that uh, what what makes you think either not at all, a little, a moderate amount, or a great deal? Got the answers coming in. Uh, we'll just give it another minute. Not a minute. Uh, most, most people have uh, have now answered. Okay, let's share that poll. Um, so, and getting some some comments coming through. So, Shannon, can you share those results with everyone? So, um, interestingly, very few people, not at all. Um, the most common answer, a moderate amount. Uh, at 60%, so the overwhelming uh, response there is a moderate amount, a moderate amount uh, with a few at a little and a, and, uh, a reasonable number, 12% at a great deal. So what, what have we got there? Uh, from Mary Clark, hi Mary, one word, politics. Um, the majority of government employees do the right thing, integrity, accountability, their track record. I work in government and I see how the decisions are made. Uh, interesting funding or lack to deliver services. So um, lack of transparency. So there's, you can see different answers for uh, is uh, leading to different responses there. Trying to do the right thing within within external constraints. Uh, great point that I think we'll, we'll explore. Before an election, less trust. Okay, public servants mostly do the right thing. Getting complicated with the political process. So there's a, definitely a an element of politics coming through there. So we've got a, um, they're, they're great reflections and keep them coming through. I, I can't, uh, they're, it's great they're coming through. I, I can't keep up with reading them all out. So uh, we'll come back. Uh, and some of you have actually touched on the next question, which uh, I'll get Shannon to share now, um, which actually brings it a little closer to home. Think of someone you know personally or professionally who works in government. How much do you trust them to do what is right? So again, uh, if you could enter your own responses uh, and then uh, once you've done that, uh, have a little look at the, uh, the chat and enter some reflections there. So really uh, interesting results coming in again. I think we're getting pretty close uh, there to everyone having answered who, who wants to. 
So, um, so Shannon, I think we might close that off now and share the, the results and then we'll go to, go to the chat. And uh, inter really interesting results there that uh, now that we've framed it around somebody you know, personally or professionally, the, the top answer, the greatest level of trust uh, has jumped from 12% to 78%. So a really, really stark difference there about uh, the relationship uh, when, you, when you know the person involved and nobody said not at all. Uh, there, there were a few people there, but it's really shifted from being kind of in the middle to right up the top and a really high degree of trust when it's at that personal level. Um, so uh, most people in government are well motivated, the structures and processes tend to undermine that, there are great individuals but they're constrained by the rules. So this is really going uh, wonderfully to, to some of the discussion we want to have and some of the, I think, the reflections that we see in other polling. Um, you know, where uh, one of my favourites is, what do you think of the, the education system? I think it's dreadful, it's hopeless, it's, it's no good. What do you think about your local school? Oh, it's great. Uh, uh, so if, if everyone thinks their local school is great, why is the system itself not great? Uh, so I think we've got a really interesting uh, question here around uh, the role of the system and the role of the individual. We really want to um, have a discussion today about what that role is of the individuals. To, to change that system. And I think uh, this is a nice way into some of the, the, the thoughts in the CPI report about human government. Um, so um, having had those uh, reflections and uh, that really interesting bit of context setting about, about our own levels of uh, trust in government, which is essentially the closer we are to it, the more we know it, uh, the, uh, the more, more trust there is in it. I want to open up to, um, to Marcus and Najay about the, uh, their reflections on those questions, maybe how they answered, and uh, their thinking about uh, what we've heard from, uh, from the people gathered here today. So, uh, Marcus, I might start with you if you want to go first. No, thanks, Simon. And um, I too want to. Uh, extend my acknowledgement of country. In my language, I'll say Wawagi Wawerang, Liwik Nagugangaguk, Wawagi Yumagu, and Borobok Nungajun. I want to acknowledge uh, the Wurundjeri people, their elders past, present. Um, and uh, I mean, some really good questions. And as soon as the comment come up about the education system just then, Simon, it really got me thinking and challenging sort of my, um, you know, opinions of, of government and how there's a clashing opinion even in my own household of where I feel the education system let me down um, as a young fella, but my wife, um, you know, would argue the, dif the difference. She basically will say what um, good governments have done has been a product of her success. Former Deputy Secretary of Department of Justice um, up until recently and soon to be an Australian Senator. Um, so, you know, in my own household, we can't agree on that. Um, but it really, it really challenged me. And um, I thought it was really insightful. And even the commentary around, you know, if there's no political will, you know, a public service is really hampered on their ability to deliver and, and go and go that step further, which I thought was really insightful. So I feel like my, uh, my thinking's already been challenged, so. Fantastic, you're, you're modeling exactly what, what this webinar series is about. Um, thanks, Marcus. Najay, did you have any uh, reflections on, on your answers and, and those of others? Yeah, definitely. I think for me in particular, I don't think I was really shocked with the responses that we saw from folks. Just like traditionally, I think it's really easy when you talk about government as this like larger entity that's more far away. Like we're talking about it as an institution where you might not have any relationships and oftentimes folks who work in government might really be really connected with other people who work in government. So they know the ins and outs versus comparing the dynamic of the relationship with someone that you have like a close interpersonal relationship with. Like, of course you trust them more, you have more interactions with them. You, you get to see the ins and out. Um, that isn't to say that there are never any cases where the government does let people down. Like, obviously we have like historical context of government leaders not often doing what is right and on behalf of their of their residents but 
I think it's a little bit hard to compare them because they're not apples to oranges because you're not dealing with them in the same context, for sure. Yeah, great, thank you. And I, I think it, it really does. If, um, I, I find it an interesting challenge about if, if our trust in government is the aggregation of a bunch of individual engagements, uh, how we get that difference between the two. Uh, so I think, I think you're, you're absolutely right, but I think it's something we'll, we'll tease out a little bit about, about potentially ways forward uh, for how to build that trust and I think the, the human uh, engagement there. So that, I think that sets the, the scene really nicely for the discussion. I want to uh, just set uh, one other kind of uh, foundation here, which is around some of the terms that uh, that we use variously. Um, so over the next hour, we're going to be uh, talking about a range of different things, and let's just maybe get a shared understanding. Uh, Najee, in your report, you draw a distinction between trust and legitimacy, arguing that they're closely related, but that legitimacy is broader, more complex, and harder to disentangle. We also talk about relationships, and as we've already said, uh, about human government. Could you just give us a brief rundown of, about those ideas of trust, legitimacy, relationship, human government? Yeah, definitely. So I guess I'll start with the simpler terms, and then I'll go a little bit more complex, right? I think when we talk about relationships generally, I think that it's a little bit easier for us to understand. They're just the interpersonal connections that we may have with another person, whether they're our friend, whether they're our family, whether they're, they're our loved one. Um, to go a step further as far as trust, I think it's something that's easy, way easier for folks to, to acknowledge, like, I know when I don't see it versus when I do see it, but if I was to put it into words, I would describe it as the capacity that we can to have confidence or rely on someone. And when we talk about when we talk about legitimacy or government legitimacy, it is a little bit broader. We're specifically talking about the relationship that exists between the government as this larger institution, whether it's like the city or the state, between the residents. Um, um, Marcus, I'm just wondering how that that resonates to you and how how I suppose you apply that that thinking to your work. I was about to jump in then with uh, an answer on mute. Um, waste some of my. Um, I think. Um, I think conceptually we look at it. So we're tasked, we're elected, and entrusted to deliver what this country has never seen. That is the first treaty process uh, or the treaty architecture in in Australia, but in particular, state of Victoria. I think government get themselves in knots thinking this notion of building trust. We're from our community, we're not setting out to build trust. Um, we've had 233 years of broken promises, letdowns um, based on, you know, colonisation. We're setting out for a relationship as equals to change the status quo of our people, improve the lives of our people. And if trust is built along that way, that's fantastic. But one message we're saying to our community is this isn't a, we don't have to trust them to be able to work with them and work with them effectively. You know, that's a journey in itself and that might be generational, but ultimately government are all about trust, you know, trust us, trust us. And it's, it's inherently not a way we look to government or we look at government. Um, so I think from that concept, that's a real challenge for our community and the journey we're going on. But what we need to do is we need to establish robust relationships that, um, you know, it can be leaned on at any point in time to achieve outcomes together, not one providing for the other. We've seen, as I said, 233 years of failure. Now's the real opportunity to start, you know, chipping away at the critical mass and change that status quo. That's a fantastic challenge, I think, to the even the premise of, of why we're here today. It's built into the, the, the topic about what does it take to build trust. And I think uh, you really helpfully, Marcus, say, well, is trust the end point? Uh, it might be, might be nice to have, but actually, can we do uh, a bunch of things that are much more important than trust? Uh, without having that. Um, so I suppose what, what if, if not trust, then what is, is the, the question to go to? If, what, what, how do you make that progress in the absence of, of trust? Uh, maybe 
maybe one day get there. You know, it's not. A, it's, I don't think you're saying it's a bad thing. Um, it's just we're we're a fair way from it. Exactly, and I think um, what is trust? I mean, ultimately, what is it? Is it empowering the government to further make decisions on your behalf for you? No. That's not what we're setting out to achieve. We're setting to move government and the bureaucracy out of our lives and us make decisions that directly impact us, our communities and our people. I think that's where you'll see change. Now, trust is a journey. There's going to be times where you build it. There's going to be times when you lose it. But ultimately, it's that journey. And if you have a robust and strong relationship, it's going to sustain those ups and downs. And I think that's ultimately what we're trying to achieve here. It's not um, we want to... We want to trust government, so let's go out and do it. It's about, okay, how do we fundamentally change the lives of our people? And what role does government have in that? And how do we hold that them accountable to fulfilling their responsibility in that journey as well? So um, as I said, it'd be great if you sort of lent to trust, but that's certainly not the goal here. But it's a bonus if you do get it. A, a great perspective. Um, Majay, I want to get, get your thoughts on this, but I'm, I'm just looking at one of the comments here from um, Russell, Z, Russell Ayers that I think it draws a really important distinction um, around, I'll, I'll just read it, it's a short comment and I think it draws a, a really important distinction. When it comes to trusting the governments, the government, citizens need a healthy dose of scepticism. They also need to be wary of that tipping into cynicism and tuning out entirely. And I think it's a really important distinction, scepticism and cynicism. Scepticism is really healthy. Cynicism is uh, is dangerous and damaging to relationships. Um, and, and actually, we want people to be rightly sceptical of government too much. We could have too much trust in government. Yeah, I definitely think that's an honest flag. I don't think that, I think sometimes when people think about government trust, I think they might immediately think about like unchecked authority, like we give them 100% of our trust, or they might think, uh, think we're there's no level for accountability. But like, honestly, if we're looking at any relationship outside of the government, it would be strange to not have any sort of accountability or any need for follow through, like that's integral. Uh, I think to Marcus's point, though, I don't know if I necessarily personally believe that it's not okay for trust to be the goal. Like I think, cause there's a lot of research that suggests that where there's greater trust, there's stronger relationships with government. And I really believe that when there is a close working relationship between government and residents, the government can make decisions and co-create, ideally co-create decisions with their residents that ultimately lead itself to better outcomes. But I do think it gets a little bit tricky when folks are so focused on wanting to create trust and be like very outcomes oriented as opposed to process oriented, thinking about like, what are the things that I need to do in order to show that I'm trustworthy? How are the ways that I can really show up for my residents so that this will occur as a byproduct? I think that if you're too focused on, I want trust, I want trust, I want trust so bad, I don't know if it will really manifest and then you also might end up doing things that feel kind of transactional as opposed to really wanting to like develop something real and long-term with residents. Great, thanks, Marjorie. Marcus, did you want to um, respond there to that? Sorry, I took myself off mute then put myself back on mute. I mean, that's a really good, um, really good example that um, Najay talks about and, um, you know, and that's some of the, the the challenges we have here in Victoria with our community. It's because um, you know sometimes it's a failure to communicate from government to our to our our citizens, and um, and you know, and there's just some people you can't reach because the messaging, no matter what it is, is just not going to cut through. And ultimately, what we're trying to do here is not empower government to make decisions that impact our communities. We're trying to build our own political power that has decision-making autonomy over our communities. And that's kind of where, you know, that relationship sort of connects, but it's exactly right. If you don't have, trust is, is critical to any successful relationship, but, um, uh, and I guess it's about how we message it within our community. That if we set out to, um, like you said, if it's all about trust, 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 it's gonna, it's gonna be pretty, pretty hollow in the end, but, you know, if we can, um, if we can get there, I mean, ultimately, you'll have a more robust, successful relationship that will create change. 
and the relationship we're looking at is equals, not um, not to empower the state, um, you know, to just comfortably make those decisions that we've seen over the last 233 years. There's lots of fantastic comments coming through in the chat. Um, and I'm just, I, I apologise to, to everyone. We will circulate uh, them in full afterwards and, and they're there. But just, I'll just want to draw out a few of them uh, before we go to Noje and the case study. Um, uh, is, the trust arrives on a donkey and leaves on horseback, slow to gain, easy to lose. Um, which I think is it, that that certainly uh, is consistent with with uh, with my experience and the idea of trust as a process rather than an outcome that it's the doing of it that is the important thing uh, and also that it's a two way street it's at least as in, we often and I think this came out in one of uh, our earlier discussion our earlier webinars um, it's not just about people trusting government but about government's trust in its citizens, uh, which then gets into interesting discussions around uh, devolution and control and, and, uh, and how government works in that way. So please keep those fantastic uh, comments coming through. Um, but at this point, this is where we're going to introduce uh, one of the, uh, the shifts in, uh, in the program based on the feedback from last year, uh, where we, uh, people were really keen to see, okay, what have people actually done? Uh, how's it been? been going out there on the ground. So I'm going to hand over to Najee to talk about some work that uh, that she's been doing and, uh, and present on that. So over to you. Thank you, Simon. I'm going to quickly share my screen so folks can follow along with me. All righty. So for today's case study, as it relates to government legitimacy, we're going to specifically be talking about the city of Detroit. So Detroit actually had an opportunity to work really closely with this city, um, with a program here at the Center for Public Impact under the Earn Legitimacy Learning Cohort, where I served as a learning liaison for this team. So I feel very, very strongly about the city of Detroit. Um, I know that when most folks think about the city of Detroit, they might not think immediately of legitimacy, but I promise that at the end of this, you will. Um, I know when I usually talk to folks about Detroit, they might immediately think about Motown because of the contributions to music that they've done as a city, or they might think about their contributions in the auto industry as the motor city in the 20th century. Uh, but they've really been on a journey for fostering greater community legitimacy over the last few years. Uh, while I had an opportunity to begin working with them last fall during the Earned Legitimacy Learning Cohort, it's safe to say that they've really been on this journey for a while now. Um, and one reason in particular is because in 2013, the city actually unfortunately filed for bankruptcy and that disrupted and impacted their ability to deliver some key critical uh, services to residents. And as a result, a lot of folks lost their trust in, in, in the city for good reason for sure, because we have these expectations that the government should do do their jobs and show up for us. But since 2013, they've really been on a deep journey to try and foster greater legitimacy with their residents, really trying to showcase that we're here to serve you, we want to show up for you, and we have the capacity to show up for you. Um, I won't be talking about their legitimacy journey for all the residents, but a particular group of residents that they've really been trying to hone in on. And that particular group are their residents with disabilities. Um, and particularly, there's for a couple of reasons why they chose to focus in recent years on trying to improve the relationship with residents with disabilities. Um, one of those is just statistically. In uh, Michigan, about 29%, so roughly about one in three adults in the state of Michigan have a disability. So if we're talking numbers, that's a little over 2 million people. So that's enough of a reason to care. Um, the second reason is in uh, the last couple of years, there have been several uh, news articles featuring community organizers and particularly uh, disability advocates who have been really vocal about how one, the city did not have an Office of Disability Affairs, um, and two, the city was incredibly inaccessible and how that was a problem. In hopes of better, like better meeting these demands and really honoring the needs of their residents, the city announced in June of 2021 that they were going to create an Office of Disability Affairs, uh, which is a super monumental act. 
However, they were not met with an enormous amount of excitement and uh, enthusiasm by their residents. Instead, it was more of a mixed response. I, I think if we were to characterize it, the response was mostly uh, cautiously optimistic where they heard from residents who were like, great, but it's long overdue. Why is this happening in 2021? This isn't the first time you all have residents with disabilities, which is a very valid critique. Uh, another response they heard often from residents was about how this is, this is the right track, you're on the right path, but there's so much room for you to grow. And since then, the city has really been trying to learn more and really been interested in like, okay, like clearly we're missing the mark here. How do we show up better for these residents? So as I mentioned, before I talk about uh, what they actually ended up doing, um, I would love to get you all's opinion about what you would do. There's a fair amount of folks who work in local government here if you were in their shoes, if you would like in the chat to, to drop, what would you do? If you were as a city recently announced that you were gonna create an office of disability affairs, you weren't necessarily met with the most positive responses. Uh, even if you don't know what you wanna do, also feel free to chat about how you would feel. I'd love to hear how you, what you all think. Okay, I see Russell, you said you would look for early wins. That is That really parallels to some stuff that they ended up doing. You would, I see someone wrote, they would get the disability sector involved. Talk to the disability sector, learn more about what they need. I see some information about co-designing. I'm a huge fan of that, definitely very relevant talk to residents, set up mechanisms, need to partner and engage, but also engage with people talking in lived experiences. I think there's, there's some really good ideas here. Look to initiatives led by people with disability, definitely. Um, there's definitely some close parallels with what you all talked about, mentioned wanting to do, and with, with what the city actually ended up doing in response. And I also wanna make it very clear that they're still on this journey. As uh, Marcus talked about earlier, legitimacy and building trust is a long-term journey. So they're still definitely on this. Um, and I'm gonna chat quickly about what they did over a 10 week period. So when they joined the Earned Legitimacy Learning Cohort, we had them go through three phases. One where they were really examining where power sat in their community. Next, we task them with really thinking about how they can better share power with their residents. And lastly, we challenge them to really think about how they can reimagine more legitimate systems that really involve their residents directly. So that gets to some of the comments that some of you folks talked about as far as like co-designing and really trying to delve into partnering with folks whose lived experiences relate to the folks that you're trying to support. Well, there were a lot of things that they did. There were four main things that the city really prioritized over the, the 10 week period that we were together. The first was they were really intentional about trying to make space. Uh, they were intentional about choosing to partner with community leaders whose lived experience really matched the match with who they were trying to better support. So as you can see on the screen here, this is an amazing group of core team, of a core team that consists of some government employees here. We have Christopher Samp, who was the director of the Office of Disability Affairs. We have Ayobami here. She was like, she was in charge of transportation, but they also had some community organizers who had been in this space and long-term advocates such as Dessa with Detroit Disability of Power. They were really intentional about trying to bring in the voices that of folks who have this experience into the room and really try to start building relationships with them because that they saw that as a long-term strategy that would help them. The second thing that they were really intentional about doing was they were open and open-minded to wanting to get smart about what residents thought. So one of the ways they did this was through conducting hour-long community interviews with residents who had disabilities. Um, and in these hour long interviews, they were tasked with one thing, please just allow, your, allow yourselves to hear what residents think. Don't tell them what they think, 
but really make space for these residents to share with you what they're hearing, what they're seeing and how they're feeling and ways that you can better show up for them. Following that activity, they used a digital tool known as Moreau, which I have some screenshots here, where they developed themes and they developed insights based on recurring things that they were hearing from multiple residents with disabilities. So a couple include uh, a lot of residents shared feeling undervalued. They felt like there was a huge failure on the local government to respond to complaints, but they were really trying to be intentional about not having these one-off conversations and being like, yeah, that's great, but really trying to listen to it and hone in and listen for key themes to say, oh, okay, we're hearing this multiple times. Maybe this is something we should prioritize or think about. Third, they were really intentional about not letting those one-off community resident interviews be the only times they try to really engage with residents. Um, they actually ended up hosting a community ideation session. So basically a, uh, just a community meeting where they invited community residents, specifically residents with disabilities, where they could brainstorm collectively. They did this primarily on the tool Moreau. Um, and they also provided space for folks to vote with using dots. So if you see the red dots on the screen, that's where folks were voting. This idea is important, we should prioritize it. So they were really intentional about not, if they were, they were really intentional about making sure that they re-engage residents as opposed to seeing it as one-to-one -one touch points where they never talk to these residents again, because they were really interested in cultivating long-term relationships that they could really begin to build. Lastly, they remained consistent. At the end of the 10 weeks, we challenged each of our cities to create a, what we called a implementation plan where they were required to think about what they wanted to do at the end of the 10 weeks to make sure that what they were, what their goal was, was continuing to be uh, invested in week by week. So they broke down their implementation plan by 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and 270 days. Uh, they were also tasked with looking at specifically at how they would measure their progress so they could know, okay, we're doing well at the 30 day mark, or we're not doing well at the 30 day mark. And they've really been using this since December to really prioritize how they're moving forward. I actually had an opportunity to meet with the city of Detroit again earlier this week um, since they actually did their implementation plan. And since then they have presented some of the ideas that they heard from residents directly to the director of human resources for the city, the chief of staff for the mayor. And they ended up leaving with an agreement that they were going to continue to connect this team to the remainder of their departments to make sure that the investment in the disability community is not really something that's only felt by the Office of Disability Affairs, but really make ensuring that it's a part of all of the offices in the city. Other things that they've done since then is in February, they, with the mayor, they actually gave a, another community presentation just to make sure that they were uh, making themselves available to residents to check in with them. Um, Last month in March, they had met with five different community uh, disability groups. They actually are planning to do another one in a couple of weeks to really continue to gain insight on what it is that residents need. Um, in April, they're planning to launch a community survey um, just for like a low touch opportunity. That way they can continue to get insights and continue to create a space so they can continue to hear from residents so that their responses moving forward are really community led as opposed to just folks in positions of power making decisions on behalf of large amounts of residents. So with that, I am happy to turn it back over to Simon um, to get us through a discussion. Thanks so much, Noe. That was fantastic, and a lot there. I think for uh, for people to reflect on, as we particularly as we move into the, what can we all do? What can we adopt into our practice? How can uh, how can we work differently? Um, I just want to pick up on a, on a couple of points uh, there, and and ask a question that's that's come through from Russell um, as well. That's that's related. Um, you talked about uh, about co-design, which is something that we talk about a lot in Anzog, and I think you know is absolutely fantastic. But I think uh, at the moment is so popular uh, that it's actually being uh, the term is being overused when there actually isn't the capacity to genuinely co-design. So it's actually potentially giving it a bad name because uh, expectations aren't, aren't being 
accurately conveyed. Um, which I, I really liked in, uh, I think it was the second to last slide, the, the, the red dots around prioritising, which is a process I've gone through too many more times than I can count inside government about, okay, we've, you know, we've come up with the ideas and now how do we prioritise? And I think the tendency of government is to say, that's our job, we'll, we'll prioritise. It's the opening up and, and actually to go to Mary's comment from uh, before the case study, trust citizens around the prioritising. Uh, bring people in to do that prioritising. So that's my way into Russell's question, which is, did the consultation pro throw up proposals that the city simply would not or could not action? And, and if so, how did it then deal with, uh, with uh, that engagement with people? I think that in the community uh, ideation session, there were certainly ideas that uh, folks posed that were ultimately like long-term solutions that would probably take a lot of time and a lot of resources. Uh, what they ended up just doing with the residents was saying like, hey, like this is just what we wanna make sure that we gain more insight from multiple residents before we decide where we're gonna invest our resources to make sure that when we do finally invest our resources on choosing an idea, we didn't do it based off of just what five residents said. Um, I know that that can sometimes feel like, oh, you're kind of brushing us off, but they were honest. They were honest. They shared what their capacity were. They were super transparent about saying, hey, like that's a really good idea, but that takes a lot of money that we might not have right now. But maybe there's a way that we can develop a plan long term to make that to meet that need. Yeah, it's a, a, a great to get to that point because that's that's the discussion that happens all the time inside government, but maybe doesn't translate outside of government. It's just sorry, no, and yeah. <laughs> that doesn't build trust uh, in the way that, that we've been talking about. So as I say, I re really want to push into the, um, the discussion around uh, kind of what works, what, what, what's what are promising experiences both from, uh, from our panellists but also from participants through the chat. And um, Marcus, I mean, I, I think you went to it earlier uh, when you set it up to say, uh, actually, we don't need uh, we don't need to get to trust, uh, which kind of fits with with my thinking. But you know, you um, Aboriginal Australia has so many very very good reasons not to trust government, um, and yet um, my my take is the the process towards treaties in Victoria has come a, a really long way in. In the big scheme of things, not a very long time. So it does does pose, uh, you know, there's still a long way to go. I, I I know there's a lot of work still to be done, um, but but that we're still going and you know, we're still at this point. So I'm really interested to hear from you about what it's taken to get to this point. What's been critical for you, for the assembly and the broader community to get to this point? Um, if it's not trust, what what has it been that's that's opened the door to something where there was such um, justifiable absence of trust. Yeah, um, I might flip it, Simon, before I get to that uh, point in the question, because um, we're in order for us to accept the process of trust, we're then accepting the power structures and the status quo of this state and accepting that. We don't, our community doesn't. We're negotiating treaty, which is a process of peace. Um, we're not in a co-design process. Our community will fundamentally say not interested, not touching it, because we're in a process of self-determination as articulated in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. 120,000 years of, in, of connection here in Victoria, inherent rights. That's underpinned by Article 3 of the, the UNDRIP for short, uh, the declaration, which is our right to self-determination, our right to political representation. So what we're building here is political power and the relationship we have with government will be a relationship as equals to the best of, you know, the however that takes shape. Um, so I think it's just good to give some sort of context if that helps that that's why we're not um, building into, into that because it's, we're in a process of improving the lives of our people through a journey of peace and underpinning inherent rights. And then I guess the work once that's delivered will be more of the mechanics of um, you know, how citizens and 
our people, you know, work together with a public service, a government and, and whatnot, uh, and our own political representative structures. So um, ultimately, how have we gone about this journey? You know, getting back to your question, Simon, uh, in doing this, well, you know, it's important to acknowledge, um, one, the challenges that were thrown at us, and two, the incredible work of the Victorian Public Service in that. One, we often forget the horrific bushfires that happened in our northeast and southeast at the end of 2019, start of 2020, which was devastating to traditional owner country. Um, and it was devastating to the state of Victoria and, and Victorians more broadly. And then a small thing called an international pandemic has thrown another spanner in the works. So um, that's why we have these moments of where we're talking through screens and um, not so much of that face-to-face -face interaction, but that's, you know, that's been the nature of, of the world for the last little while. But one thing that we've really focused on with our community and this journey is just the consistency, consistency to show up and to governments credit their consistency to show up. We're not agreeing, we're arguing, but we're continually uh, showing up and representing our interests throughout these negotiations. And we're doing the same for our community. So I think that changes a, a great dynamic, but also creating the ability to go, okay, you know, even through the lockdowns, and I think we're the most locked down state in the world, Victoria, Having the conversations with, you know, with our community members, what does life look like with tree? What does 10 to 20 years look like now when we've settled treaty, we've settled peace? What is that hope? What do you want different? What do you want for your kids and your grandkids? How do we create and through, you know, even through truth telling? A Victoria, whether you're a traditional owner of country or whether you're a non-Indigenous person living on Aboriginal land, how do you create that sense of connection to your fellow Victorian and that sense of belonging for your kids and their grandkids? That's, that's the goal here, yeah? Because who's going to walk next to us and stand with us? That's kind of the society we're trying to fundamentally change and build here while improving the lives of our people. Um, and so we've really focused for our for our communities in the you know the darkest days of the lockdown. What does hope look like? Where do you personally fit in this piece of work? Um, and how do we collectively drive this movement to get everyone on board and build a better Victoria for everyone? Ultimately, that has been our principal approach to delivering, as I said earlier, what this state has never seen, and that's. Um, that's treaty, but that's a, a united Victoria that embraces the oldest living culture in the world, that celebrates mm. the oldest living culture in the world, that our kids and our grandkids all feel a sense of connection to and pride in understanding that, hey, this is something amazing here. Yeah, and, and congratulations for as far as, for as far as you've gotten. And I think that consistency to show up, um, I think that, um, uh, which really goes to, I think, one of the things we would, uh, Najay and I were talking about the other day around time, just how much time uh, this takes uh, and that consistency um, and the ability to disagree and keep going, I think. Uh, which, in interestingly, um, as you were saying that, Marcus, I was thinking, hmm, isn't, isn't the consistency of turning up, isn't the ability to agree and keep going, I feel like that's a hallmark of trust. Maybe there's proto-trust there, even if uh, it's not at that point. But um, that, that, that to me feels like, uh, a, a, if, if not trust, the green shoots of it. Um, so, um, Najay, I wanted to just to bring you in there just around the time question, um, because it is so critical. And I also want to encourage uh, participants out there. I, I'm very happy to keep talking to uh, Marcus and Najay all day. Uh, and I've got, got questions uh, that I would still not get to, but I, I really want to give you the opportunity as well. So please uh, enter them in, in the chat, but Najay. It's about time. Um... Yeah, I don't know if anyone has been able to really define like this like five step plan of if you do these five things in five years, you're going to have trust because that's just ultimately not how relationships work. They're messy, they're complicated, they, they're, you're dealing with people's egos, you're dealing with people's feelings. So 
I, I don't want to, I don't, I don't think it's fair to like, to lead people on, especially if folks are in local government and they really want to create that trust to tell them, oh, it's only going to take two years. It's only going to take three years. It might take a long time, especially if you're taking into context that if someone's had years of maybe not so great experiences with the local government where they may have felt unheard or they may have felt unlistened to, or they may have felt devalued, like we heard some of the Detroit residents talk about. I think that I think that people who are in positions of power and in leadership, I think they just have to ultimately decide, is this something that they're deeply invested in and they're deeply interested in seeing this to the, for the long haul? Or if they're interested in being a part of a process that they ultimately might not even see in their lifetime, they might just be setting up the framework or the, the process for people years from now to be able to benefit from. Um, I know that's not, it's not a super, it's not tied up with a bow and very nice and super optimistic, but it's the truth. It is, it's going to take time. People have been hurt and it takes people time to, to come back fully open and receptive when people have been hurt and disappointed. Yeah. yeah. And I think that recognition from government side is just critically important that it's going to take time and that there is that pain and hurt and history. And uh, one of the things I, I kind of reflect on in, in my career as a public servant is um, distinguishing between me and the government that I'm representing, that I represent uh, a lot of pain and suffering in, because of the institution I'm, I'm representing. It wasn't me. Um, it may offend my personal values greatly, um, but I can't distinguish that when I turn up uh, wearing the, the government uh, the government hat on the position uh, more than on me. Um, so, Najay, I want to, to stay with you uh, here for a, for a moment, and because one of the things uh, that really resonated for me in your report was about how alien government is to many members of society. And uh, so I left government about three years ago here in Victoria and started working with people who really wanted to engage. They were active, they were passionate, they wanted to influence government policy. And it struck me just how um, how little they understood about government. And first I was thinking, what's going on here? You know, these are people that um, really, you know, they've been around government for a long time. And of course, it took me too long, but I got there to work out, ah, it's not them, it's government. It's, it's the government's really good at being secretive about these things, about being internally focused. And when you're in that machine, it all makes sense. Every, you know, you can see why one thing flows from another. It, it's a self-replicating institution, but from the outside, uh, it's uh, a, a kind of somewhat mysterious beast um, that, that doesn't necessarily make sense. So um, given that you identified that in, uh, in your uh, report, I'm just really interested about any examples you came across where government was made less alien and what it was that people did to, to do that demystification. Yeah, definitely. I, I'm also going to say that that's something that we heard a lot of, even in the earned legitimacy learning cohort. Um, one of my core team members who was a community organizer, she was very honest. Some people would call her brutal honest, but we needed the honesty where she said, to be honest, the government is viewed as cold and distant and not really invested in the lives of residents. And she challenged the city leaders on our team to really lean into vulnerability because that would take away from, that would really chip away at the perceptions or the, the ideas that people have of them to really be able to distinguish between government, the entity, versus maybe the local employee named Tim or John, who, who is different than, who is their, an own, their own individual, who is different than the government. Um, I think one of the ways in which we really encouraged uh, city officials to really like be able to like humanize themselves and really like demystify themselves is really honestly to lean into vulnerability and transparency. Because I think one of the things that we often heard from city officials would say, we're getting criticized, but they don't really know like what our limitations are. And that's fair, you're getting criticized because people only have what you have shown them to react to. So I think that if folks have the capacity to be vulnerable and open, as long as it's not breaking any rules and have the capacity to share with people, hey, you know, like that is a that is a problem that you acknowledge. It's going to take a lot of resources and a lot of time. Would you like to be a part of maybe like an advisory board to help us through that process? Like there's a lot of steps that city officials can do to really just lean onto vulnerability so that then they're not seen as these larger than life alien or larger secretive entities. 
Fantastic, yeah. And again, really resonates with, with my experience of, I want to tell you why I can't do this thing, but it's it's a cabinet decision, so I can't. I'm sorry, I just need to kind of be stony-faced and it looks it looks irrational for to you and now you're I'm losing your trust because of them doing something that doesn't seem to make any sense. Um, Marcus, um, I'm, I'm guessing there are similar experiences that, that you've had with that vulnerability in, in engaging with government through, through your processes. Yeah, I'm sorry to, uh, there's actually a, a, a question that I just want to answer in the chat as well um, that, that Mary asked around election support, uh, cycles and they completely destroy trust, just to be uh, blunt and, and short absolutely destroy trust because politicians and politics often use uh, Aboriginal affairs as a political football and political point scoring. So, and then they expect to come in and work with us and wonder why we don't trust them. Um, but um, I guess um, governments are inherently difficult to, to deal with. I mean, they're, they're a beast um, and they've been doing this quite a long time. And if I'm talking, I'm to talk at more of a higher level, Simon. Um, ultimately, what we're doing is to shift that thinking uh, from government. Like you gave a, an example of of cabinet or cabinet incompetence, don't they love hiding behind behind that? I wish um, I could actually. Well, I don't wish I could, but imagine if I hid behind the decisions the assembly make and um, and didn't tell our community. You know, it'd be absolute. Um, it'd probably be a riot in the not too distant future. That's just the reality. Transparency is, is key and critical. And one of the challenges we've experienced, not so much through this journey in these negotiations, because there's a different shift of power. Um, and we've got legal instruments to hold government account accountable during these negotiations. But, you know, it doesn't fit with what the authorizing, the authorizing environment is. So then, you know, um, Policymakers then have to fiddle, shift, or you know, window dress something that they want to do, uh, which is fundamentally not getting to the heart of the issue or the cause. And that's why we see the ever-growing data around closing the gap, um, and wonder why you know it's not actually. Well, we wonder why Aboriginal people in Victorians uh, life expectancy they die ten years younger. I mean, this is supposed to be the most progressive state in the country, but this data, which is designed to or basically ultimately uh, defines our lives as, as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, it continually grows and no government, no public service is comfortable with that data or sits comfortably with it. But, you know, we acknowledge the restraints that the authorising political environment can put around that through investment, cutting of resources, lack of imagination, um, or simply allowing Aboriginal people to sit in the driver's seat, which we're setting out to achieve, to make decisions that impact their lives. And so ultimately, I'm just getting back to this power shift and this power dynamic that um, that we're currently challenging right now. And um, But we know the public service and we know government are up for it, but it's just how do you stop the churn of that beast to stop, think and re-pivot to what is actually going to create uh, a better system? And, and is it, the systems matter so much. I'm, I'm thinking about the you know where, where we started with this this thread around um, cabinet incompetence that our, our friends and colleagues in Aotearoa, Aotearoa New Zealand um, have a very different, different system around cabinet incompetence, where uh, cabinet papers are published. I think it's 30 days after the cabinet meetings. But you know that that would that blew my mind when I heard about that. Uh, working with in the Victorian government. Uh, so these things that we hold to be true uh, are just rules that we've, we've kind of put in place and we obviously need, need to follow them whilst ever they're rules, but they're, they're rules put in place by people. Not far behind that, Simon. What is our publishing? 20 years? So we're getting close. Rounding error, rounding error. Um, so uh, guys, got a, a, a question here that I think harks back to the, the, the Edelman uh, data that goes to, um, uh, you know, the, the situation is not significantly different for business, media, NGOs, and uh, guys asking about uh, are these issues not just about government, or is this about people's connections with large organisations? How can you have a relationship with an organisation apart from through people? So, Nasha, I think that, that links nicely to, to, I think, to where you landed with, with our human government. 
Yeah, I think that uh, given that it's going to be really hard to build a relationship with a larger institution, I think it has to ultimately come to individuals. I think individuals who are in government have to decide like what they want to be representative as. They have to like think about like, okay, me as an individual, me, like how do I want to show up in this space? How do I want to better represent or maybe create a different dynamic that hasn't previously existed? So that can look like Maybe I will not make decisions on behalf of my residents. Maybe I will be intentional about carving out space to be around so folks know me, so folks have relationships with me so that they can have a different interaction. Maybe that means that if I'm in a position of leadership, I set the tone in my office that, hey, we in this office don't make decisions on behalf of this community, but we will make decisions with the community. Like we're, we're gonna show up differently than what has previously happened and ultimately my hope, my hope, of course, you know, legitimacy takes time, right? And people can decide how they feel. They can decide what they think of you and whether or not they deem you trustworthy. My hope is that over time, like generally in most relationships, that they see that people are acting trustworthy and that they show that they are people of their word, then a different dynamic can exist. Did you want to add anything there or? I think, it's, um, I think it's a really good question and um, I might tackle this a bit a bit differently just you know thinking off the top of my head uh, and if I think about from treaty as sort of uh, of that vehicle um, there's two key critical functions one is the institutions that we build so there's that institutional relationship and um, two, it's the culture of those institutions of how they operate uh, throughout time, which is going to be critical. And I often see it, um, and it might be a really bad example, but, you know, how governments take shape and they have, you know, departments of foreign affairs. How do they talk to the outside work through the world, through that institution? So ultimately, that's how we're trying to build relationship and inevitably over time, potentially trust through the institutions we build that represent our interests and that government build that represent theirs and how they talk to each other, what that relationship is. So it's not about me and someone in government. It's, it's generational through the culture of how they behave, but also importantly of how they're established and what their functions are. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's kind of how I visualize it, uh, Simon. Uh, again, it's the this kind of the role of the individual and and how individuals build culture and culture outlives the individuals in in that role uh, is is where you get that lasting change. We're we're very close to time, but I do want to go uh, to the, the a point you raised there, Marcus, um, and indeed almost where we started today um, around institutions. Um, in your uh, op-ed in the Age, uh, the start of the week. You talked about the Yorok Justice Commission as essentially the first Aboriginal and Royal Commission, which um, you know, going to this idea of sharing power and real self-determination. Self-determination has been talked about for a long time. It's easy to say, but it's it is genuinely challenging to the way that that um, our governments work. Um, and yet we have this this, and I think you've, you've summarised it beautifully. Essentially, the first Aboriginal led Royal Commission. Uh, I can't think of a precedent for something like yeah. that as, as shared power. What does this do for the process and what did it take to get there? And kind of, you know, what, where do we go? Yeah, for yeah. Me. Just um, a couple of reflections on that process, Simon, and then jumping into um, the York Justice Commission. I mean, the boldness of the Victorian public service and the leadership of the Victorian government, and just for the record, this is probably be the last compliment I'll ever offer them, is really <laughs> making it difficult for us to criticise because they're stepping into the moment on what we're calling for and owning their responsibility in it. We called for this nation's first ever truth-telling process, never been seen before, roughly 40 around the world, most famous being the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa on the apartheid. Um, Looking over 233 years, the impacts of colonisation, the genocide that was committed. Like talk about a level of boldness to step into that and look beyond electoral cycles. I mean, that's, 
that's a credit to um, the government and that's a credit to the public service meeting us halfway. But then what you don't often hear is that we held the pen as the first people's assembly, the representative democracy of our community in the treaty journey, we held the pen and were the authors of those terms of reference, the mandate, which then become the letters patent. And then we had an independent panel to select five commissioners. We had two spots on that panel, government had one, uh, and the International Centre for Transitional Justice in New York uh, had another. So we had the power in those scenarios. So you talk about, you know, this, this journey that I talk about trust, you know, all the right moves are being made, but you don't see government out there talking about how wonderful they are. They understand that they have to be a good partner in order to move this forward. And that's a true testament to actually doing that. And a surprise, I've got to say a surprise from my end, I didn't expect it. Um, but, you know, it's this real true partnership and relationship that we're trying to settle through a treaty, but government are making all the right steps. And you can't underestimate the public service. While I spoke earlier about the authorization envir environment, the public service can block things if they like. Like, let's be clear. I mean, we, we know from our community perspective, the, the sort of the, the yin and the yang to the public service and the political arm, but um, it's their boldness and government's ability to step into this that has delivered this nation's first ever um, truth and justice process, not truth and reconciliation process, truth and justice process, um, uh, which is the, the Yoruk Justice Commission, Yoruk being the word for uh, truth in the, um, in the Wamba Wamba language. Um, and I think it's a really significant step forward and milestone. Now, what is their role as a Royal Commission? To gather the evidence. They'll gather the evidence of the systems and structures that disproportionately impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Treaty will deliver the reforms. That'll be the, that's where the change is created. On behalf of my, uh, my former colleagues in the Victorian Public Service, thank you for, for that acknowledgement. And I think uh, more important, much more important than that, it is uh, a, a testament to the difference that individuals within a big system can make uh, through their through their actions and behaviours. So, um, so thank you. Now, I could talk about that single topic for the rest of the day, um, and I'd love to come to you, uh, Najee, but I'm really conscious I want to give Ariadne uh, time to uh, give us some of her reflections. There's uh, no small task. Uh, given the, the breadth and the, the depth, depth of the conversation. So uh, over to you, Ariadne. Thanks, Simon. Yes, I was thinking it was a bit of a, a big ask. Um, and it is really important to acknowledge the um, what Najee and Marcus have told us about how we think about trust. And they're getting us to fundamentally rethink it. And when I was thinking about what to say, I wanted to start for that point, well, why do governments need trust? Why do they need trust from citizens? And part of it is, is to do government better, that government, you know, processes that serve communities and citizens in general. But then I also wanted to think about, well, how do we know when we've got a level of high trust? And maybe we need to think much more about trust is a variable. Australia traditionally is low to middling on trust. We had a bit of sort of a high trust moment in the first year of the pandemic when there was actually a... a a committed relationship between the between governments across the country and citizens in terms of protecting our broader health security but that ebbed away quite quickly so if we think about high trust and as both marcus and Najee pointed out it's a process it's a journey it's not just a static outcome it changes over time it was really important to take that away so then i thought about well what can we learn from countries that we know do have high levels of trust. If you go to OECD data, it's consistently Scandinavian or Nordic countries, um, also Switzerland. And there are some things we can learn about from those countries that have this high level of trust between citizens and their governments. And we need to think about it on three levels. We tend to think about it predominantly as at the individual level. But the individual level doesn't tell us all of the picture. But even if we just look at that OECD data alone, places with high trust, it's places with high levels of equality. 
And this is really important at that individual level, and this is clearly coming out in the discussion today. But then we can think about trust at the collective level, and we could hear today that trust is as a process, it's shared, it's about relationship building, it's also about consensus building, not adversarial uh, politics as usual. So that individual level is important for equality, collective level is important for thinking about uh, the relational processes to building trust, but then we also shouldn't discard the institutional or structural level. And that became really clear. New structures were set up through um, through the Europe Commission, through what was happening in Detroit, working with, um, with, with local communities. So that institutional level really matters. We need to see that government is responsive. But also, I was a bit worried when I was looking at the chat that people like to abrogate the discussion to, well, it's just politics that gets in the way. But politics and government are the same thing. Ordinary citizens see them as the same thing. And we need to kind of work with, with that understanding as well. Government is inherently political. So these were kind of my thoughts about how we think about trust on those kind of different kinds of levels. And if we're in a low trust environment, and this is my kind of segue, Simon asked me to segue into when we're going to talk about storytelling. And storytelling in some ways, and it came out very clearly in both Marcus and Najee's accounts of, of the work that they've been involved in, uh, storytelling is a way of thinking through this. So storytelling is also a process. Um, and it's a response to evidence-based arguments for change and creating broad social, political and economic change are no longer won by having the best data sets. It's not about your surveys, your economic or trend data alone. The facts don't speak for themselves in creating change in communities or that, that you know, achieving higher levels of equality. Instead, a story-driven ap approach is based on personalised experience. It's based on emotions, but it's not just people telling their own stories. It's about stories being built into a broader narrative of how we build awareness, build understanding, but also build a sense of collective identity and empowerment. And this is kind of, and also it's about telling successful stories, which is part of what we've been doing today, is thinking about what can we learn from successful processes for change. Yes, they were fraught. Yes, politics was part of it. But we also need to think about moving beyond deficit discourses and thinking, how do we focus on success for change? And we can think of social campaigns that use those kinds of story approaches. In Australia, the marriage equality campaign and the Every Australian Counts campaign to get disability reform were really powerful moments of using stories to build awareness and build broader empathy. So what does this matter for politics and government? Public servants and politicians already hear stories every day. These stories are selective. They're based on their own networks often and based on their own kind of um, biased sets of experiences and the world that they live in. So instead, we probably need to use this moment to think much more about how do governments hear and listen to stories, listen to people, but also how do they tell their own stories? How do they shape and create change stories that show that they're responsive, that demonstrate that they actually know how to listen? So again, it goes back always, as Marcus and Najee pointed out, to that relational, how we understand the relational. So it's not just about hearing people's stories, it's about demonstrating that you've listened. So I guess my last point is that governments do need to learn how to trust citizens to build that kind of genuine relationship. And that's all for me. Thank you. Fantastic, Ariadne. Thank you so much. That's an amazing job to, uh, to distill that down. So I really appreciate that. And particularly want to underline your challenge about not abrogating responsibility as a public servant. Uh, there are always um, factors and powers and uh, structures that we work within and we work within them and we push and we, we make things happen within those structures. That's, that's the art of, of being uh, a really good public servant. Um, thank, a huge thank you to our panellists, Marcus and Najee. What a fantastic discussion and so much to think about and importantly uh, to do. I could happily, uh, as I say, yeah, chat about this all day. Um, we will be circulating a post webinar survey, uh, which will arrive in your inbox shortly. We've made some changes, as I said, and we're really interested to hear your feedback uh, and to, uh, to keep learning and evolving uh, how we do this. We'd also love for you to access the Reimagining Government a Series website, 
which has material on today's topic around the, the case studies, interviews, articles, and David is going to drop the URL into the chat uh, where he has already well done. Uh, David, uh, we also really want to foster a community of practice that's passionate about this work and reimagining government. So please join the community of practice. Uh, and when you do, uh, when, when you're visiting the website, uh, we'll be hosting a workshop specifically on Najve's uh, case study. Uh, so come along to that. Uh, we'll send out an email in about two weeks with some more information about all of those events. So you know, don't try and write it all down, uh, including a wrap up of today, uh, the, the, uh, a, a blog and the, the recording of this, as well as uh, the, the chat that's been going on uh, in, on the side there. Um, please join us for the next in our 2020 series that will be happening in June. As Ariane said, this will be on how do stories enable social change, and that will be moderated by my friend and colleague, the very wonderful Thea Snow from CPI. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, to attending that one. Finally, thanks to each of you for your attendance and participation and uh, your contributions in the chat. I really encourage you, if you have two minutes right now, and hopefully you do because it's quarter past the hour, not on the hour uh, or the half hour, just take a little bit of time to think about what you've heard today and what you're going to incorporate and how you might uh, practice differently. So thank you all again and uh, have a great day.